Today on Primary Care, we talked to family medicine physician, Dr. Alexia Norwood, about black women's health. If your whole issue with getting exercise is because of your hair, do something about your hair, because your hair is gonna lead you to chronic illness. Hello, I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe, and welcome to Primary Care. It's no secret that the health status of black women is in a critical state. Research studies have shown that across the spectrum of class and socioeconomic status, black women's health remains the poorest. Four out of five are overweight or obese. One out of four middle-aged black women have diabetes. Over 40% have high blood pressure, and the list goes on and on. Here today to talk with us about the health of black women is Dr. Alexia Norwood. Dr. Norwood is the service chief of family medicine at Henry Ford West Bloomfield and the director of community health education and practice development for the Henry Ford Medical Group. Dr. Norwood, welcome to the show. Thank you, we Dr. finally got you here. Yes, <laughs> good, it's a pleasure good. to be here. Good. Thank you. Those statistics, terrible. What's, what's going on? So we, we know this, is, this isn't something that's new. There's been some chronic some issues uh, going on with women's health and the, the health of the African-American community for, for decades and decades. The report in 2013 by the CDC looking at the health disparities as well as inequities showed quite a few areas where the African community is adversely affected from um, from high blood pressure to diabetes to heart disease, but we know that there are a lot of factors that go into play there. So what are some of the conditions that disproportionately affect black women? Yeah. Well, t here's the biggest. The biggest is heart disease. Heart disease is still the number one killer of men and women. We know that um, when you think of the, the 10 major causes of death in the African-American community, number one is heart disease, mm -hmm. number two is cancer, and number three uh, is strokes, right? And all of those affect African-American women more adversely. So here's what we know about cancer. Women who, for instance, breast cancer, which is the number one cancer for women, Caucasian women tend to get breast cancer more, but African-American women tend to die from breast cancer. A true more. disparity. A true disparity, because they're diagnosed later, and very often by the time that they're diagnosed, the cancer is spread, so the, the outcomes are poor. So. The black female population, what level of awareness do they have about these types of statistics, these types of outcomes? Well, we, we know that we need to do a better job. We need to do a much better job. The health disparities in our communities very often are talked about in silos, and we need this conversation to be on a much larger plane. We're not doing enough to get the word out, just not in beauty shops and in churches, but we need to make sure that that word is in our schools before the diseases occur, that we do something about them for prevention. So the, the conversation isn't nearly on the platform that it needs to be. So we have a communication problem. Yeah, you, we, we know that very often the issues that affect African-American communities are, not, are more around the problems as opposed to the solutions. So a lot of our, our adult men and adult women who are suffering from chronic diseases hear about it, but they never think it affects them. You know, they don't believe that those illnesses actually affect them. So for instance, we know that African-Americans are the highest population for suffering with hypertension, high blood pressure. But yet, you have no symptoms with high blood pressure. But most people think as long as they don't have a headache, as long as they're not feeling tired, they don't have high blood pressure. When we know that high blood pressure is the silent killer, and one of the number one contributors to, especially for us here in Metro Detroit, with kidney disease, which is very prevalent in Metro Detroit, and heart disease. The number one risk factor for heart disease is high blood pressure, and most people don't believe they have it. Absolutely. Thus, the, the, the sudden appearance over the last several years of all these dialysis centers yes. in minority communities. Yes. So that's, that's one of the reasons is, and especially in Metro Detroit, we have one of the highest communities in Metro Detroit than anywhere else in the country for kidney disease, for kidney failure. So, yeah, hence all of the dialysis units. But when you think about it, Dr. Joe, not only the, the kidney disease and the high blood pressure, we know that all of these chronic illnesses have a basis of partly in long-term racism 
Secondly, in lack of education. And thirdly, lack of access. And let me also add, most of all, lack of having some peace. And we'll talk about what that yes. actually means, yes. um, which we were talking about a little bit earlier. So when you think about all of these factors coming together, that, that it makes for a perfect storm for our community to not get the access, resources that it needs. And in our own city, I'd be remiss not to even note Flint, Michigan, where we're having a All crisis currently yes. with our population yes. of adult women, African-American women who look yes. like me, our African-American children that look like my kids, where they have had an exposure for, for year, for over two years now, of lead exposure, where their memories, their abilities to achieve academically, and for adult women, adult women and men, high blood pressure, fatigue, muscle aches, rashes, all of those effects from issues that could have been completely avoided. So we know that in our communities there are issues around health and unfortunately issues around the politics that can sometimes affect our health. Absolutely, and the cost. We just hit $100,000 per year to dialyze one patient three times a week. An amazing figure. We're really uh, doing something wrong or can do a better job. Back to black women and especially adolescents and teens, are you seeing the disease state in this population come down in terms of age, in terms of the, when they begin to have a problem, or are we pushing it the other way? You know, some diseases, we're, we're pushing up the uh, life scale instead, okay? But some seem to be coming down, and unfortunately, it seems to be in the African-American population. Are black women victims of this also? So we, African-American women are the highest risk of all ethnicities for obesity. The highest risk of all for obesity, as you mentioned. So we know that one of those conditions that's directly linked with increased weight is diabetes and metabolic syndrome or prediabetes. So we're seeing that younger women, younger kids are being affected with diabetes, elevated blood sugars because of the increased weight. We, here's where the community comes into play and actually adds a lot of benefit. To, to treat diabetes, a lot more money and less effectiveness than preventing diabetes. We can prevent it. We can prevent it. It's a preventable illness because most of it is related to obesity. So how do we come back to obesity? Eat from the ground. Eat things that grow from the ground, not things that grow from factories. Processed foods, Taco Bell, beer, whatever name you want to put to it. Processed foods and less exercise increases your risk of, of obesity and those increase your risk of diabetes. We can do something about it, Dr. Joe. Absolutely. Tell us what the role, as you see it, of the primary care physician or the primary care provider in, in the role of treatment of this population. Not that it's that much different from anybody else, but should there be a different focus? Well, you know, I, every patient I feel, of course, I'm a primary care physician, I, I believe that every patient needs to have a primary care physician to take care of their overall needs and to look at them from a global aspect, as opposed to looking at them specifically from the, the aspect of their heart disease or their blood pressure or according to a disease, because they're more than a disease. They're an entity in and of themselves, not just a disease. So I think if you have at least someone who looks at you as a person, then you're more likely to have all of those diseases hopefully prevented. What's the role of the patient? Yeah. I get this pushback. Uh, can't get my hair wet, can't go to the gym or have a membership, haven't used it. What's the patient responsibility in this? Well, it's interesting. We, we know that in the African-American community, for women especially mm -hmm. with hair and exercise, it's a huge issue of uh, what should we do and how do we do it. Um, you know, and, I, and, and I get it. I get it. Uh, the, uh, the Archives of Dermatology in 2012 published uh, an, an article noting that 40% of women said that they didn't exercise because of their hair, and 50% of them said that they wouldn't exercise as much if they'd recently had their hair done. So w we know that this is an issue. Of course, Chris Rock told us it was an issue some time ago. Um, but thankfully for us, the big issue is still around chronic disease. And that is exactly what I want women to take note of. If your whole issue with getting exercise is because of your hair, do something about your hair. Because your hair is gonna lead you to chronic illness, chronic disease, premature death, yeah. and a lot of illnesses and mortality, yeah. increased mortality, simply because of your hair. So I wanna make sure that every woman hears this clearly, Dr. Joe, don't use your hair as an excuse. Instead of finding excuses, find solutions. 
put the emphasis where it gets the most bang for the buck or the activity associated with it. Yes. Absolutely. We're going to take a break. We'll be back with more of our discussion with Dr. Norwood when we return. Marie, you have prediabetes. Prediabetes? I don't have time to eat right or exercise. I'm a busy mom. Oh, you're a busy mom. Yeah. This is great news. Busy moms never get prediabetes. Wait, what? Let me just... Yeah, this is all the people at risk for prediabetes and way over here, busy moms. No? Whew. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Alexa Norwood, Chief of Family Medicine and Director of Community Health Education and Practice Development at the Henry Ford Medical Group. Dr. Norwood, um, most black women don't see healthcare providers that look like them. Um, can you comment a little bit on that type of disparity and what it means in terms of our inability to achieve outcomes? I think it's, uh, it's really critical that uh, we increase the line of diversity in, in healthcare, that we increase the knowledge and the understanding of the, the need to have people in health professions long before they get in high school, and hopefully we start planting those seeds even in elementary school. That's how we bring up increased generations of physicians, nurses, practitioners that will be able to provide care for the communities. I think that it's most important that a, that a patient has a physician who understands them and knows them. I, I, I don't think necessarily that the doctor has to look like you, but the doctor has to understand, understand you. Yes. The doctor has to have compassion towards you. The doctor has to hear you. The doctor has to want to be able to do what's best for you. And I think of that again, and for instance, in Flint, Michigan, we had a pediatrician who was an, of Asian descent who cared about that community and did something that she knew needed to be done for them. So if you have a doctor who at least listens to you, cares about you, and does what's best for you, then you have a physician that's the best one for you. It goes without saying that that is not happening right now. If this was football, we'd have all the tape and the data and the statistics on ninth graders who can run a football, throw a football, shoot a three-pointer, whatever, but it isn't. It's the healthcare of the country. It's not entertainment, it's not sports. It's a serious business called trying to improve outcomes in this industry called healthcare. Where is the effort, or what does the effort need to look like, okay, in terms of actually raising up the nation of physicians and providers that are gonna serve this country going forward? Well, I would love it if, um, if the country had a tolerance to paying physicians the way they pay people to kick a ball through a field goal. Uh, I would love it if the country had the tolerance to realize that in order to be able to kick that football, that person actually needed a teacher and someone who would train them and a physician that would actually keep their leg healthy and treat that sprain so that the ball actually goes through the hoop. These are the things that I think we are missing in healthcare, that we're, we assume that the people who, who do these jobs, and thankfully they do it because of, of a passion. You became a doctor, Dr. Joe, not because it paid you a million dollars a year, but because it's something that you had a passion for and you wanted to make sure that you did something to help people who were in need. So I'm hoping that as we start to raise up additional generations of individuals, that the compensation will go along with it. We need our kids look and they see the diversity of activities and fields and careers that they can do. When compensation doesn't follow it, very often the, our brightest kids go off and do something else other than doing things in healthcare or in teaching and education. So we need to make sure that not only do we train and prepare, but we also have the funding and the, the compensation to go along with that so that our brightest are not kicking field goals, our brightest are actually taking care of patients. And in order to do that, the country needs to come to grips with this age-old discussion of racism, because that seems to be one of the rate-limiting steps in getting us to help black women achieve things like treat to target, treat to go. Do you experience any of that uh, in, in this, uh, this wide spectrum of what we do? Well, Dr. Joe, racism, we know, continues to exist. As long as we can have a conversation around health disparities, there's going to be a discussion around racism and the opportunities for us to do things differently and better. What I, what I love to, to what, what I take solace in knowing is that as racism is an issue and intolerance and disparities are an issue, 
there are people like you and me that are looking to find the solutions. And as long as there are people working to find the solutions and to make healthcare better, to make the disparities go away, because our goal is elimination of disparities, that there is still hope. So I, I see the problem, but my focus and yours is on making sure that we find the solution because there's too much to do. So here's an issue. If we continue to talk just about the problem and we don't ever put any energy, resources into finding the solutions, we will continue to just have noise and no work. What should the average African-American female be doing in terms of primary care preventive medicine? For our listening patient audience, touch on that a little bit. So, Dr. Joe, I think it's really important in primary care that women realize that there's some basic things that you can do that will improve your health. Number one, see your doctor. Connect. See your doctor so that you will have the opportunity to get your physical done. See what things, preventive medicines need to be done, including immunizations and um, checking your blood pressure. Since we know that there is no signs or symptoms when your blood pressure is high, that checking your blood pressure becomes important. It's important for women to also sleep. Sleep is an important part of restoring your body's overall health. And most people don't think about sleeping because sleep is something that's considered to be as little as you get, then you're, it makes you a braver, stronger soul. <laughs> but actually, it decreases your body's ability to fight infections. It decreases your ability for your heart to heal. It makes your heart and your blood pressure work much harder when you're not getting enough sleep. So I want them to sleep. I want them to see a doctor. And most of all, I want them to have peace. Peace within their walls. Peace within the walls of their house if they are victims of domestic abuse so that they get the help that they need. Peace within the walls of their minds if they're suffering from depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, excessive worry to get the peace that they need. And peace within their bodies if they have high blood pressure, chronic illnesses, any illnesses that they've been dealing with a long time, cancer, heart disease, to realize that if they get the help that they need to control those illnesses and treat them, that they'll have better health. And most of all, if they do things now, they can prevent them from ever occurring. So I want them to have peace within their walls. Amen. Um, we need to take a break, but when we come back, I want you to talk about stress as it relates to overall health especially women, focus on women because we know you guys got a different role to play in this society. So let's, let's, let's get to that as soon as we come back. We need to go to a break. We'll be right back with more primary care. You listen when your body says, I'm tired or I'm hungry. What if your body said something else might be wrong? Gynecologic cancers, cervical, ovarian, and uterine cancers have symptoms. So pay attention. If your body says something may be wrong, please listen. If it goes on for two weeks, see a doctor. It may be nothing, but find out, learn the symptoms, get the inside knowledge about gynecologic cancers. There are over 34,000 Daves in Southeast Michigan. Big Daves, medium Daves, baby Daves. At Henry Ford Health System, we're inspired by every Dave out there and every Shannon, Sharice, Miguel, and Ahmed. Because no matter your name, we believe care should be built around you, not someone like you or near you, but care designed for just one person, you. Henry Ford Health System, all for you. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Alexia Norwood, family medicine physician at the Henry Ford Healthcare System. Dr. Norwood, stress. Black women, the stalwarts of the black family under stress, social, financial, political, educational, it goes on and on. To pair stress with the disease states that you mentioned previously gives us bad outcomes. Can you comment on that? So Dr. Joe, um, you know, some people think of stress saying, oh my gosh, I have so much to do that I'm stressed, that it's cute. Stress is not cute. Stress is killing our communities. This is what we know about stress. We know that when you're stressed, your blood pressure is higher. That increased pressure affects your heart. Your heart becomes bigger. It performs less effectively. You can have more fluid buildup in your lungs, more swelling occurring in your legs because your heart isn't working properly. We know that stress affects your mind. That increased worry affects your ability to sleep so that you have increased headaches, muscle tightness, tension, pain in your joints. That stress can actually cause you to have premature death there was um, one study that actually showed 
that African American women who live in areas of both poverty, where they have decreased uh, decrease access to health care, and they have decreased income, and when they have increased levels of stress, that those women, when they become older, they have 10 years prior earlier death than normal, I hate to say the normal people, but people who don't live under those circumstances, as well as decrease in ability 10 years earlier. An entire decade? An entire decade. They have premature inability to move as freely, their, their activities are affected, and they end up having 10 years earlier, earlier problems with illnesses and increased death risk. So we, we know that stress isn't cute. So you need to make sure that you do things in your life to decrease the levels of stress. Stress also causes you to get increased swelling in your belly where you get more abdominal fat. And we know for African-American women, they tend to carry more of their weight in their hips, which is the right place to place it, their hips and their buttocks. We call that having more of the pear shape. But we also get the, the bigger stomachs. So when your belly is getting bigger, that increased stress increases cortisol, a stress hormone mm -hmm. in your body mm -hmm. that causes you to have increased belly fat. And that increased belly fat increases your risk of heart disease. So stress isn't cute. There is a lot that we can do about it, and it adversely affects your health. Statistics show, Dr. Norwood, that the majority of black women in this country live in the South. Do black women in rural areas or southern locations experience any different type of health care challenges? Do they present in a different way? Are they suffering from any variations in what we would see here in a city like Detroit? Well, we know that people who live in rural communities, for instance, may not even have access to the internet, right? They may have poor access to, to clean and healthy water, um, access to resources, including opportunities to, to be engaged in their health care where they have free information coming in that they are able to use to prevent some chronic illnesses. So there, there is some disparity, especially in rural areas where there is less connectivity mm -hmm. to resources, information, especially health systems where things are available. And we do know that people in the, the South have different patterns in terms of exercise. That, and, and this is very, very true, especially in African-American communities where there aren't sidewalks for kids and adults to be able to walk in, that the communities aren't safe. And if they feel that they're in an area where they're not safe, then they won't be doing exercise outside and getting out in their community. Even in a rural area, a female who doesn't have access doesn't have access. Yes. Or an urban area, a black female and her children who don't have access don't have access. So the mm -hmm. outcomes basically are yeah, going to be similar or the yes. same. Right? Yes. Yeah. So, so exactly. So it's more around those determinants mm -hmm. that you mentioned access to health care. Um, the ability to pay for their prescription medications. One of the issues that we find too with, uh, for instance, African Americans tend to be on more medications than their counterparts. So there is an increased cost burden even to take care of the chronic illnesses that they have because the average person has four blood pressure medications for their blood pressure, four medications. But if they have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, leg problems, decreased circulation, headaches, all of those different medications, there's an increased cost. Why most women, and it's reported that most African American women, report that very often once a month there is a medication that they don't take related to cost. So all of those issues would affect how our disparities continue to, to be increased in our communities. There is no denying that having a mindset that is rooted in faith and prayer makes a difference in outcomes. Dr. Joe, there is nothing that matters more. Uh, when I talk about peace being within your walls, the walls of your mind, you can't have that peace for me without having the love of God and the, the presence of God to provide that. You know, when, I, when you have peace within your body, so for all of those chronic illnesses that you exist and that exist, and this I think is so key for every African American, and, and regardless of ethnicity, but for every African American to know that when you start talking about chronic disease, because quite a few of them affect our community, that there is hope. Just because you have it, you don't have to die from it. When you don't have it, you don't necessarily have to get it. For people to realize that you don't have to have a chronic illness because you're an African American, even though it's prevalent in our community, it doesn't have to be for you. And when you have it, there's an opportunity for it to be controlled, treated, and resolved. So it is so important to be connected to something that's bigger than we are. 
medicine is finite. We don't know everything. It's finite. It's a finite body of knowledge. But God is infinite. <laughs> so <about> his <laughs> answers, his <laughs> solutions are infinite. There is more information that we've yet to tap into that God already knows and that God will hopefully give that information to us so that we can use it to treat patients appropriately. So prayer can actually decrease your heart rate. Prayer can decrease your blood pressure. Prayer can help with those increased worries and, pe and pieces where you're unable to sleep to give you the peace that you need so that you sleep and allow your body to rejuvenate. So I believe that without prayer, especially in my practice, I wouldn't have one because God sustains me every day to allow me to do what I do. You know the source of energy. Yes, I do. <laughs> He's in me. Very He's good. In me. We only have about 100 more questions for you, but oh. we're, we're out of time. But just briefly, tell already? me. Already? Already. Tell me the three top things. If you had to advise black women, what would be the three top things that you would tell them to do for their health? So the top things I would say, number one, stay connected. Stay connected to your doctor, to a healthcare source, because medicine is constantly changing. Secondly, make sure that you get the healthcare needs done for your chronic illnesses. Keep those things managed and controlled. And lastly, let there be peace within your walls. Dr. Norwood, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us here. Thank We've you, been sir. talking with Dr. Alexia Norwood, family medicine physician at the Henry Ford Healthcare System. For Primary Care, I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe, and we'll see you next time.